Ford sold over 20,000 of these the day they introduced it. And after driving this one, I know why. We've all seen so many first-generation Mustangs over the years that the magnitude of their impact on the industry is often overlooked today. Ford hit the biggest home run of all time with this little car, and one of the cats behind the horse was a former engineer named Lido, as in Iacocca, who along with Hal Spurlick identified that Ford had no entry-level car that would get younger buyers excited to buy a Ford. So a team of Ford designers, including Gail Halderman, were tapped to come up with some designs. And Halderman's original sketch, dated July of 62, depicted a sleek, sporty ride with a long nose, a short deck, and angular lines. And that basic design held true through several revisions and clay models, and eventually made it to production. And the rest, well, that's history. Iacocca was a sharp marketer, and he wanted his new car to command the spotlight from the start. And he wisely chose the 1964 New York World's Fair to launch the car, where it had minimal automotive competition and maximum media coverage. In fact, a near twin to this car was used in a display designed by Disney that gave fairgoers autopilot rides in brand new Fords. Mustang went on sale on Friday, April 17, 1964, and Ford sold over 22,000 1964 and a half Mustangs the very first weekend. Naturally, the Mustang's combination of hot styling, hot performance, and cool price will make it a big thing with the youth market. Young of heart of all ages, who hitherto have found this perfect combination unavailable in any car with such a low price tag. The Mustang proved that the youth market, in this case, the huge baby boomer youth market, was hungry for something fresh and exciting to drive. With over 680,000 Mustangs sold from the 1964 and a half release to the end of 1965. So let's take a look at our feature car, a 1964 and a half Mustang 289 convertible. It's a fairly run-of-the-mill Mustang, as it's not the high-performance 271 horsepower version known as the K-Code, but it is a cool little V8 four-speed car here in the Brothers Collection. The base 289 was rated at 225 horsepower at 4,800 RPM and 305 pound-feet of torque at 3,200. And it was a stout design that stood up to the demands of heavy-footed, youthful drivers. It featured hydraulic lifters and a four-barrel carb, and this one has power steering and drum brakes. And even though it's not the limited production hypo or even a Mustang GT car, we think cars like this still deserve some attention. As a fun car to drive, even base Mustangs had decent handling, with convertibles getting reinforcements underneath. And behind the attractive tri-bar spinner wheel covers are 14-inch wheels wrapped with a white line tire, just as it would have had when it was new. Hypo cars had the flashier dual stripe red line, but the white stripe goes well with the white convertible top on this one. Inside, this car is fitted with red bucket seats, floor console for the four-speed shifter, and a dash that boasts the optional Rally Pack gauge cluster. The Rally Pack added a 6,000 RPM tachometer and a clock mounted to the steering column and attractive pods. Hypo cars got the 8,000 RPM tach, but this one goes to six. This 64 and a half might not be the fastest Mustang in the Brothers collection, but what's cool about it is until it entered the collection, it was still owned by the original family that bought it new. So the Brothers collection has extended them an invitation where they can come visit the car anytime they want. Mustang styling was a hit from day one, 
as these cars resembled little else on the road in 64 and a half. The long nose suggested speed and a big engine, even if it was hiding a base six cylinder. And the hop up quarter panels featured simulated scoops down below, again, suggesting speed and performance. The basic design remained the same through 66, with over a million sold by March of 66. Iacocca and his team read the buyers in the market and delivered what they wanted at a price they could afford. It sounds simple, no? It's interesting to me that with all of today's social and communication technology, the market seems much harder to read. Judging by the sun-faded carpet and the well-worn seats, it's obvious that this car was enjoyed. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Muscle Car of the Week. If you uh, have some thoughts, you can share them in the comment section on our YouTube channel or maybe join our Facebook page. And we'll see you next time with another well-enjoyed car from the Brothers Collection.